and uh, thank you for joining me early this morning. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the imaging findings in COVID-19, of course, a hot topic uh, these days. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me advance. So I'll start with uh, briefly describing COVID-19 uh, virology uh, and the imaging findings, particularly the chest X-ray and CT findings in active infection, um, particularly patterns the course uh, mechanism of, of disease process uh, and the imaging differential diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> go on to talk about imaging use in COVID-19 uh, in persons under investigation uh, and tips and resources for us radiologists. So my apologies ahead of time. Uh, uh, there was two days to prepare this talk and so some of it might be a little bit rough around the edges and I may have tried to cram a little bit too much information in this talk. Let's see, I know the hard stop is in, in uh, in 7.30 and I'll aim to keep it to such that we have some time for questions. Um, this is the most recent update from the Johns Hopkins website on active and confirmed uh, COVID infections. And you can see from the chart here that of course, North America is, uh, is heavily affected as is Europe. Um, and in terms of confirmed, uh, uh, confirmed and also active, these are active cases. You can see uh, actually China and Asia has actually diminished in pattern, whereas more confirmed active cases uh, are active in Europe and North America. So it's pretty incredible to think we take stock back uh, about three months ago that a virus that emerged in, in bats uh, and jumped into a few humans um, and has jumped into our crowded cities um, and uh, basically brought the world down to its, to its knees. Um, as you can see here, bats uh, live in, in caves and are in crowded conditions, and there, there are uh, quite a reservoir for uh, various viruses, including coronavirus. And as this make, makes its way into the human population, we all know it's spreading quickly. So I think we're looking at the power of an exponential process here. Uh, and by our social distance me measures, we're trying to um, stop the, the curve as early in the logarithmic rise as possible. And of course, we've all experienced the impact to our lives um, and to the world's economy. So uh, the virus itself is called SARS-CoV-2 uh, or the coronavirus or the beta genius of the coronaviridae family of the order Nivaralis. Okay. And the disease itself is called COVID-19, coronavirus disease 2019 cause by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Previously also known as 2019 novel coronavirus. And also just to point out that there are multiple other coronavirus strains that infect humans. And we've seen in 2003, uh, emergence of SARS, um, original SARS-1, uh, and also the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2012. And there are strains of coronavirus circulating in the population that uh, give rise to seasonal URIs. So the current pandemic is not a black swan event as um, other pundits have pointed out. We humans have known this for decades um, and authors have warned about the coming uh, epidemics and pandemics in the world. This book was published in, in 1994 and I read this when I was a medical student. We, I think we medical field all knew that something like this was coming. So quick uh, look at the coronavirus life cycle in order to understand its imaging features um, as many of already know the virus is named for the uh, appearance of the crown because of the spike proteins on the surface. And the proteins uh, bind to the cell receptor, in this case isolated uh, as the angiotensin converting enzyme two receptor. It binds to the receptor and it's taken into the cell uh, where its RNA is uh, migrated into the cell cytoplasm uh, and hijacks the cell mechanism for making uh, proteins an assembly uh, such that new viruses are produced uh, and are released from the cell. Hence, this, this is a very abbreviated version of its life cycle. So let's get into the radiology of the findings here. This is one of our patients uh, with one week of cough, fever, myalgias, headache, and diarrhea. Um, and this is a presentation chest x-ray. As you can see here, it can be called normal um, by a quick look. There are probably subtle findings that uh, increase interstitial markings, uh, what looks like interstitial markings in the right lung, but difficult to, to say definitively if there was uh, an abnormality here. He did receive a same day CT and playing through here. 
as you can see, there are areas of peripheral ground glass, uh, patchy, uh, and with more consolidated areas, um, and it seems to be a little bit more predominant in the uh, dependent aspect of the lung. Let me drag through the stack again to show you, to give you another look here. Okay, and my goal is to show you multiple cases just to get familiarity of the pattern of findings here. Uh, and there's, of course, radiographic progression here uh, and three days later, making it very clear that there, is, there are abnormalities uh, in the lungs. This is the next patient uh, that we have, is a cruise ship passenger uh, with one week of fever, cough, and diarrhea that had been quarantined. And here you can see patchy areas of ill-defined opacities on the chest x-ray. And three days later, uh, there's progression with increased um, ill-defined opacities and what looks like interstitial markings, um, as we'll see on the CT, that can be a um, somewhat of an optical illusion imposed by ground glass opacities in the lungs that accentuate the interstitial markings. So here, scrolling through, again, one sees the peripheral areas of patchy ground glass, in this case, more consolidated opacities. As we get toward the lung bases here, you can actually see crazy paving, uh, the so-called sign uh, for combination of ground glass and inter and intralobular septal thickening here, most evident here in the dependent aspect of the left lower lobe. Here. Okay. Next patient. Uh, this is a more confusing case because of the history. Uh, this woman had uh, respiratory symptoms starting three months ago, uh, back in December, and in the past three weeks has been uh, getting progressively worse. And the chest x-ray shows, again, ill-defined opacities in the lungs, somewhat subtle, uh, but definitely there. Uh, and four days later, there's progression of ill-defined opacities. CT scan. Again, shows patchy areas of ground glass and uh, more consolidated opacities, as you can see here. Um, and somewhat subtle uh, findings here among these areas of ground glass opacities, you can see where the areas of the lung that are relatively spared. Uh, you can see this lobule is relatively spared. This is a paralobular pattern um, indicating what we can see in organizing pneumonia. For example, here, this lobule is relatively spared. And because the a patient received a chest and pelvis, uh, their findings of um, diarrhea, uh, as you can see in the small bowel here with fluid in the small bowel. Uh, this is, uh, these are a few scans from the literature here showing progression of disease. Uh, this is a woman uh, was traveled to Wuhan, China. And here you can see uh, two scans, three days apart from each other. And you can see what originally looked like patchy areas of ground glass, again, uh, has increased in size uh, and extent, again, with areas of lobular spearing, uh, as you can see here. Um, fairly recent papers now emerging uh, tracking the course of disease seem to show that uh, the peak of opacities of lung findings are centered around 10 days. And so depending on the um, duration of symptoms, um, it's not surprising to see relatively milder, a smaller areas distribution becoming more confluent and larger over time. Okay, here's another patient here. Uh, and here in the lung apices, there are changes of chronic granulomas disease. Uh, and four days from the initial CT, one can see increase in extent of extensive ground glass uh, and areas of emerging consolidation here. Again, evolving, increasing findings of pulmonary opacification here. Again, in a very uh, basilar predominant uh, and also peripheral pattern of patchy pulmonary opacifications. So this is a summary graph from one of the first analysis of uh, time course of change uh, depending on disease. And I thought this is very helpful. Uh, early in disease, here in the blue bar, okay, uh, intermediate uh, time uh, frame of uh, days of symptoms, three to five days, and later in the uh, course of symptoms, six to 12 days. And so in the first two days, almost half of patients uh, will have a normal looking uh, CT scan, uh, whereas the um, in the intermediate stage, uh, relatively few have a normal CT scan. And even in late stages, a small percentage, uh, less, less than 5%, will have a uh, normal looking chest CT. And so as the disease progresses, one can see increasing consolidation 
progressing now to greater percentage of lungs exhibiting, or rather greater percentage of patients with consolidation in the lungs in, in here in, in a later disease. Bilateral disease, as we've seen already, um, it can start in one lung, and then with increased extent of disease, you can see it emerging in both lungs, and such that bilateral disease is the predominant pattern in middle and late disease patterns, uh, and also the peripheral distribution as the extent of opacification increases. The linear opacities likely re represent a scarring and fibrosis uh, from the organizing pneumonia process, and it's seen in later in disease in a minority of patients. So to summarize CT features of COVID-19, ground glass and consolidation occasionally with crazy paving, it just patterns of pulmonary opacification, patchy, bilateral, and can be unilateral early, basilar predominant, uh, peripheral, uh, and can be rounded or nodular appearing in up to 50% of patients, uh, and emerging as an organizing pneumonia pattern with what we call the atoll sign or reverse halo sign and perilobular areas of distribution of pulmonary opacities. It's also helpful to point out what are the absent features as at least so far seen in disease. Um, there's a lack of low bar consolidation more indicative of bacterial pneumonia. There's a lack of, rather, the cases are always almost found with ground glass. So a lack of ground glass only consolidation will be unusual. Uh, there's a lack of, COVID, uh, of uh, cavitation. Um, no lymphinopathy is typically seen and lack of pleural effusion here. Um, also, these findings were described from previously relatively healthy patients with findings of COVID-19. And so as we get more complex patients in our service, one has to recognize that there can be uh, coexistent disease findings of superimposed patterns um, on top of each other. One striking thing is the lack of tree and bud opacities. We typically think of that as airway spread of infection, but so far it's imported uh, it there's a lack of tree and bud opacities in our reports seen so far, suggesting it's a lack of mucus um, and plugging or airway uh, thickening seen in disease as well, which is interesting. So I think by understanding the infection mechanism, we can take account uh, and better understand the imaging findings. Uh, and so of course, aerosols and droplets are, are generated during a sneeze or a cough or even during uh, breathing, and that's inhaled into the lungs. And the particle size is particularly interesting because one has to keep track that um, 2.5 micron particles goes further into the lungs and settle in the lungs and are taken up in the alveoli. And the, these are studies emerging from or were characterized the previous SARS virus, SARS-1, I guess, uh, and uh, the same receptor is used for cell entry. And the highest expression of ACE2 receptors seen are seen in pneumocytes, uh, small intestine enterocytes, and vascular endothelial cells throughout multiple organs, including the heart and kidneys. Uh, typically, this is not found on the surface of nasal oral mucosa, uh, and studies are still emerging because there are reports of, of people losing their sense of smell and potential neurological infection of disease. Okay, and here's a simple chart uh, basically showing the disease process. Uh, as you can see, this is a normal uh, alveolus, and early on in infection, the virus in inhibits, inhabits these um, cells, pneumocytes, and inflammatory cytokines are released, still having a normal CT appearance. Uh, as the alveolus fills with fluid, uh, one can see ground glass emerging, uh, and as the progression of, uh, progresses, and also organizing pneumonia sets in re the repair process, the cells fill up the alveolus um, and entirely consolidating the lung, and hence you see the consolidation pattern on CT. Uh, and just a brief aside about ground glass, uh, one can see that uh, these are examples of, of braided or ground down glass, uh, and the term was introduced into the Flash Society CT lexicon in 1996 uh, as hazy increased area of attenuation of lung with preservation of bronchial and vascular margins uh, caused by partial filling of air spaces, interstitial thickening, partial collapse of alveoli, normal expiration or increased capillary blood volume. This is not to be confused with consolidation in which bronchovascular markings, margins are observed uh, and um, ground glass can also be associated with bronchograms. And so just to point out the physics of things, air by definition uh, is minus a thousand Hounsfield units or equivalent to zero grams per cc. And normal air rate of lung uh, is minus 900 Hounsfield units 
uh, or 0 0.1 grams per cc, whereas water is zero household units and one gram per cc. And so ground glass occupies a large range of densities, anywhere from minus 800 to up to minus 100 household units, whereas consolidation is closer to soft tissue density. We like to point that out because our densities that we see in lungs are very different from what we typically think about uh, in terms of soft tissues in the rest of the body. And so to summarize, mechanism of coronavirus infection imaging findings, there's aerosolization of respiratory particles containing virus, inhalation, settling areas of greatest airflow. There's viral attachment via the ACE2 inhibit, uh, to protein, um, viral replication, and pneumocyte destruction. Um, and the body copes with it by initiating repair of leakage of uh, fluid uh, and cell debris into the alveolar spaces, emerging into an organizing pneumonia pattern. In vast majority of patients, this will heal. Um, however, in a minority of patients, small minority, fortunately, um, patients progress onto diffuse alveolar damage. Um, just a brief uh, look at sterling forces uh, governing fluid migration in the lungs. Uh, here is an alveolus, again, uh, the capillary bed here and interstitium in between. Uh, and taking you back to medical school, this is the equation that describes the migration of fluid uh, into the alveolar space. And so, in case of diffuse alveolar damage, when permeability of the basement membrane is increased, uh, one and holes are formed in the basement membrane and into the, inter, into the interstitium, into the alveolar space, fluid and debris migrates into the alveolar space, producing filling and ground glass. Here, here's a patient with typical diffuse alveolar damage involving the entire lung, lung uh, and the lung becomes a wet sponge, basically weighing itself down, as you can see here on CT. Uh, in contrast, cardiogenic edema, the capillary pressure is increased such that that increased pressure drives fluid into the alveolar space. Uh, and because pressure is closest around the heart, we get the typical perihilar, uh, so-called bat wing appearance of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So the imaging differential diagnosis of ground glass opacities, of course, is fairly broad. Uh, and to help you think about other disease processes, of course, top of the list is other viral and typical bacterial infections, including influenza, pulmonary edema, drug reaction, pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, acute lung injury, inhalational uh, causes, and other causes, uh, and more exotic entities like acute yourself pneumonia and acute interstitial pneumonia, which I don't have particular time to go into here. Uh, chronic findings of ground glass, less relevant in uh, a lot of these patients now. But you have to keep in mind interstitial lung disease, such as NSIP, chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis, and smoking-related lung diseases. Organizing pneumonia traditionally was thought to be chronic, but this disease process is now changing our perceptions, given the how fast evolving emergence of organizing pneumonia this disease process is. Uh, other exotic entities include things like chronic acidic pneumonia, particularly uh, overlapping given the peripheral distribution, uh, vasculitis, lung adenocarcinoma, fibrosis, uh, and the rare entity, uh, pulmonary alveolar pneumonosis. So here's a 50 plus year old firefighter with progressive URI symptoms. And one can see increased ill-defined opacities in the lungs. On day three, he's intubated here. Uh, and day four, complications emerge, uh, such as extensive subcutaneous emphysema uh, from pulmonary interstitial emphysema occurring. And this is the CT scan here on day four of uh, hospitalization, one is just struck by the extensive subcutaneous emphysema uh, here infiltrating through the tissues here. You can see dependent uh, consolidations along with ground glass opacities. Uh, hospital day 10, uh, things are progressing with increasing ground glass and dependent opacities reflecting diffuse alveolar damage here. And here in the anterior part of the lungs, one can see increased cystic change. This is due to barrel trauma uh, and from being on ventilatory, ventilatory support here. And this is a case of H1N1 influenza back in 2009 with diffuse alveolar damage with imaging findings that can be very similar to COVID-19 currently, given a similar mechanism of infection. So some of the patterns here, this is a, a person with diffuse ground glass. Uh, with vaping associated lung injury. That seems so important a few months ago, but now that's faded into the background. Uh, this is a patient presenting with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage uh, with per first presentation of Wagner's granulomatosis. This is a patient with cardiogenic pulmonary edema and dependent ground glass and pleural effusions. 
This is a patient with classic organizing pneumonia, more chronic with then consolidation, the atoll sign here. This is a, a patient, again, with organizing pneumonia within the basis in the context of connective tissue disease that progressed to fibrosis. Okay. Uh, and comparison of CT findings with RT-PCR, which is the current gold standard. So turnaround time here, we've experienced even up to 72 hours of PCR. Sensitivity is reported to be 59 to 71%. Uh, other uh, sites have claimed higher sensitivity. This is what's been published so far in the, at least in our radiology literature. Specificity is assumed to be 100%. If you're positive for COVID-19, there's a very low chance of false positive. Uh, however, as we've all seen, this can be limited by access and uh, availability of reagents, even including things like nasal swabs now. And there are intense research into new tests, and new tests are emerging currently, including a one-hour bedside test. SCT uh, use right now is still very controversial in terms of uh, COVID-19. Uh, we all know it can be short scan, uh, scan time, but interpretation can depend on radiology's availability. And the caveat here, of course, the star is that uh, required room decontamination and turnover may require even up to an hour of air circulation in ideal conditions. Sensitivity has been reported to be in the range of realistically 70, 90%. Uh, first report claimed as, as high as 98% in which we've seen uh, from these studies that early on in the disease process, particularly within the first two days, uh, findings may not be apparent. Specificity, uh, these are some of the earliest studies. And, and so um, this is not a typo here. This has been reported to range from seven to 100%. And that's why specificity is the biggest difficulty here. Uh, this from a paper in which seven radiologists looked at the specificity of calming COVID-19 infection compared to other atypical sapphiral pneumonias. Uh, and the range from 100% specific on some radiologists to one radiologist who had 7% specificity. He was basically talking, calling any kind of opacity in the lungs as COVID-19. Um, fortunately, this is why we do this training session. Most rads are in the 90% range after training, even a brief as reviewing some cases and watching a short online tutorial. Um, the 7% uh, radiologist here, if you dig through the paper, was somebody with 20 years experience but had not undergone any training for COVID-19 imaging findings. Um, and of course, as we all know, any test, the positive predictive value does, depends on disease prevalence. Um, limiting issues, we all know, is radiation exposure. However, low-dose CT is possible, even to uh, on the order of one to two millisieverts. And the, the significant impact to radiology workflow must be considered with scanner decontamination and our worker um, protection protocols. So current recommendations for CT scanning for COVID-19 diagnosis, the ACR does not uh, recommend routine uh, CT uh, diagnosis, uh, and as followed by the STR and, and the Association of Emergency Radiology. So is there a role for CT scanning in COVID-19 uh, per some interest under investigation? I think it depends. Uh, if the result is, is critical to clinical decision making, uh, in Wuhan, CT used as a triage tool when the healthcare system was overwhelmed and patients were rapidly isolated from their families. In the setting of high COVID-19 prevalence, uh, a higher pro pro positive predictive value is expected uh, given high pretest probability. Uh, and CT sensitivity is increased when duration of symptoms is greater than two days. Or it, also in the setting, if molecular testing is severely limited or if logistics of protection scanning decontamination and radiologist workflow are well considered and established. So you're faced with chest radiograph on OPD. And here's a positive study. Uh, here's a suggestive phrasing to use. Pulmonary opacities are present, differential diagnosis for which include viral infections. This is a patient who was found to be COVID-19 uh, virus positive. These are all three chest radiographs, including the seven-year-old. Uh, for a COVID-19 rule out. Um, reasonably, these are negative chest x-rays. Um, one suggested term is no pulmonary opacities visualized. Please note that chest radiographs exhibit low sensitivity for subtle ground glass opacities that can be seen in viral infections. These patients were all subsequently found to be COVID-19 positive. Here's a CT scan. Uh, normal is the case, it's the easy case, no abnormal pulmonary opacities. Here's a patient with COVID positive CT. Uh, and I think one reasonable phrase to use is findings are compatible with, but are not specific for our infection, including COVID-19. 
So in summary, infection with SARS-CoV-2 virus produce acute lung injury, manifesting as predominantly patchy bilateral basal ground glass consolidation opacities. Evolution is self-limited, of course, in a large majority of patients with organizing pneumonia pattern. RT-PCR is the current gold standard for testing. Uh, after greater two days of symptoms, CT exhibits greater sensitivity. Uh, specificity is valuable and can be improved in radiologist training. This is a field of intense research, and of course, and many, many encouraging developments as the world uh, unifies um, to, to combat this process. Um, so I think we'll all get this through this together. The news coming now is, is more and more dire, but I think there are many bright spots in the future. Um, on second thought here, that's probably not the best image for, for uh, current times. Uh, maybe all of us standing together and separately probably is more fitting for our times here. So thank you for your attention. Um, um, oh, of course, I'd like to point out uh, there are some valuable resources here, including RSNA special focus here. Thoracic radiology uh, has, our society has a fantastic lecture on our website through this link here. This is the link to the ACR guidelines. Uh, and this is the, to the Johns Hopkins COVID-19 tracker. These are some selected references uh, here uh, from most recent literature and pathological review of coronaviruses. Thank you very much. Open to questions.